Hello and welcome to the next Conversation with Giants in Medicine, hosted by the Journal of Clinical Investigation. I'm Ushma Neal. Today I speak to larger-than-life scientist and 2013 Nobel laureate James Rothman of Yale University. In the 70s and 80s, Rothman bucked all scientific dogma and advice about how to do scientific experiments and broke open cells in order to study the way that vesicles are transported. His discovery of the machinery that orchestrates the budding, fusion, and transport of vesicles is key to organelle formation, nutrient uptake, and the secretion of most hormones and neurotransmitters in the body. These discoveries are key towards being able to control the muscles in my face as I speak to you, to the secretion of insulin from the pancreatic islets, to deal with the lunch that I just ate. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about the man behind the legend. Do you think you could start by telling me a little bit about what you were like as a child? Oh, Ushma, you start out with really the, the, the hard questions. <laughs> you know, um, I guess uh, I was playful, but I was also a nerd. Uh, my mother says that I didn't say anything at all until I was about three, and then I spoke in complete sentences. And everybody who knows me since knows that I usually can't shut up. <laughs> so uh, that's been a lifelong pattern. Um, I think I was a pretty normal kid. Actually. What did your parents do? Uh, my, my dad uh, was actually a practicing pediatrician in a small town in Massachusetts, the only one for many, many, many miles around. And uh, my mom was a homemaker and also uh, very much uh, involved in his practice. Do you have a time in your youth when you started to get most interested in science? You know, um, that's a, that is a, a question that a lot of people ask me, especially uh, students ask me that, when they're trying to figure out you know, what, what direction they're going to uh, go in. Um, I would say um, I always sort of knew I was going to be a scientist. And I know that sounds really dumb, okay, but I think it's probably true. Um, there was a time I think I wanted to be a fireman but it was very brief. You know, the, the thing is, uh, I was born in 1950. Uh, I grew up uh, in an era that was, uh, you know, where, where uh, the U.S. was sort of ascending after World War II uh, in, in the world order, uh, where technology uh, and uh, especially physical sciences were, you know, very uh, important to all of us in daily ways. You know, uh, I remember, uh, like many people my age, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, uh, you know, uh, the, the fear of nuclear war was uh, very much there. That's physics in a funny way or a perturbed way. Um, the space program, uh, the transistor was invented, the first radios, uh, jet airplanes. It was a very dynamic time, maybe even more in some ways dynamic than now. And so um, it was and scientists were really among the most admired, maybe the most admired, you know, they have these polls, uh, you know, who is the most admired, this or that. And scientists uh, were really very, very high up in those polls, yeah. So you couldn't help but uh, sort of uh, notice that as a kid. Now your early interest was in physics, correct? Yeah, that's right. So you ended up going off to Yale to study physics. I did. But yeah. then pivoted towards biology. Right. Why? Uh, now that's actually, there's a really discreet moment in time, yeah. Um, I, I was really going to be a physicist since I, you know, like I said, about the earliest I could remember. Uh, Einstein seemed like a famous scientist. Everybody talked about Einstein and Oppenheimer. They were physicists. I didn't know what physicists did or what they were, but it seemed like it would be nice to be one of them. So, uh, you know, I sort of headed in that direction. Um, when I was in my, last, my second to last year in college, my dad, who I mentioned a moment ago, uh, was, was a doctor, said, really, you ought to have a, have a look at, uh, at biology. You know, maybe, you, you know, there are very few jobs for physicists, the way all of us parents think today and uh, have always thought, you know. And so, you know, maybe you'll never make it as a physicist. Maybe you should think about being uh, a doctor, okay, or maybe that would be even better for you. And of course, I immediately rejected that mm -hmm. because uh, one of the first things you learn uh, as a uh, physics student, it's sort of not explicitly taught, but it's all but explicitly taught, is that physicists are really smart and mathematicians are even smarter, okay? But physicists are really good, okay? Chemists are not really very smart and biologists are outrageously stupid. And chemists, you know, they're at least they're doing something that's physical, so they're socially acceptable, but biologists don't go anywhere near that. 
So uh, it took a little bit, actually, to overcome that prejudice. But I went to my first, uh, uh, out of respect for my dad, really, I went to a, my first lecture in a biology course since my freshman year in high school, and it was a complete turn on to me. And, uh, and the change was almost immediate because, you know, in physics, uh, you know, even uh, to, to penetrate to the research level is very difficult. There's so much known, there's so many layers of formality uh, before you can really even access a meaningful research question. And in biology, it's not that way at all. Even today, we, we, we know a lot. Uh, we've always known, we always know more than now than we did before, ha happily. But, but it's always the case that you, you hear about a phenomenon, you learn about something, and immediately five questions come to mind. And, and they may be naive or they may not be naive, but they're all research level questions. So somehow the immediacy of, uh, of, of access to the frontier of what was not known even as an absolute novice, I, I'm absolutely sure that's what attracted me. And it was instantaneous. And so that was goodbye physics. Goodbye physics yeah, and just, hello medical school. Well, yeah, in a way. I mean, um, I did go to medical school after college, which was sort of, an un, on, on the face of it, an unusual thing to do with that kind of a pivot. Uh, in my case, I, I never really had any doubt that I was going to do research. And at that point, I was going to do biological research. but. I felt that, uh, and I think correctly in retrospect, that I didn't know what direction of biology to go in. I mean, I could have done something that would be convenient that would be sort of more related to physics, but I just, my knowledge was so limited that I, I felt that any decision I made wouldn't be well reasoned and that I just needed a, a greater breadth. And so I, I went to medical school. I have about nine months left at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I think my mother would still like me to take a sabbatical and, and get my medical degree. Uh, I'm joking about that, but actually that was true for quite some time. You know, I, I had to explain to her that I actually was a real doctor of a sort. And uh, it may be the Nobel Prize in medicine makes up for that somewhat, I don't know. So once you got to medical school and you went through and you decided you did want to do yeah. more research, how yeah. did you stumble upon the topic that you wanted to do your research on? Okay, so, you know, choosing a problem is in some ways the hardest thing. In my case, it was fairly easy because I just fell in love with what we now call vesicle transport. And, and uh, this happened actually in my uh, first year medical school. Uh, and uh, there was a lecture in histology. And uh, the work uh, of George Pilati was being described, I mean, admittedly in a watered down way, but <clears throat> frankly, I'd really never heard of the endoplasmic reticulum. And I didn't know there were transport vesicles. And he had just discovered you know, these just extraordinary events that went on within a cell. And it seemed to me, you know, how could all this happen without a guiding hand? I mean, it, it seemed as though it was a sort of life in a microcosm within the cell, a kind of an economy of movement uh, and movements between that are choreographed and programmed. And I just couldn't even imagine how something like that would work. And that's kind of what attracted it, me to it, because it seemed on the one hand like a, a sort of physical process. I mean, to make a uh, a vesicle out of a bigger object to make a bleb from something, that's a, an act of physical change. And yet somehow that occurred in a living cell and it guided in, in a very specific way and it, was, and it was a complete mystery. And so I somehow, it wasn't at that moment I said, you know, I'm going to work on that, but it somehow it registered with me as, uh, as powerfully interesting, fundamental and important. And so later when, uh, when the time came, to, uh, uh, to, to you know, get serious about a, a long-term problem. That happened uh, as I was doing my postdoctoral work. Um, I, that was really very clearly what, what I had in mind. Now actually, there was kind of a, a, a complex interlude between those two events, um, of course, several years. But uh, most notably, I actually didn't want to uh, initially be a biochemist. I was really attracted uh, to being a neuroscientist. And uh, the, air, the, the thing that attracted me the most as a medical student in science was neurophysiology. And, you know, at the time, uh, the, the things that we take for granted now were not known. And Harvard had arguably the best uh, neurobiology department uh, in the world. In fact, there weren't that many neurobiology departments then uh, in the world. So uh, I joined the MD-PhD program after my first year in medical school. And uh, I was uh, asked to apply to a graduate program. So I applied actually to biological chemistry and I applied to neurobiology. 
And I was absolutely set on going into neurobiology, except I wasn't admitted to the program. And what did I want to work on? I wanted to work on the mechanism of synaptic transmission. And it's just so funny in a way because, uh, you know, and so the result of that was I was accepted into biochemistry. I'm, I was very happy with that. I became by, arguably a pretty decent biochemist. And, uh, and I learned how to think and breathe and approach the world as a biochemist, not as a neuroscientist. And, you know, in the fullness of time, many years later, uh, I, 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 you know, my lab and I uh, essentially uh, solved a, a long-standing problem of uh, neuroscience and specifically in respect to how synaptic transmission works. And when I look back on it, and actually with a little amusement, but I, I really quite seriously, had I been so fortunate as to have gone to graduate school in neurobiology, I can almost guarantee that I would not have solved the problem that I set out to solve, at least in that way. Probably not at all, because the element of luck uh, together with uh, a way of approaching the problem. So I learned a way of approaching problems that came from classical enzymology and biochemistry and was rooted in the tradition of German chemistry and biochemistry, really going back to the late 19th century. And that was what I was rooted in. That was my scientific ecosystem that I was trained in, the way I learned to think about the world. And, and it's that way of thinking that actually enabled me in what might seem a circuitous way to solve the problem that the neurophysiologists were also working on and obviously very interested in. You know, it's kind of ironic. Right? I think. Certainly. Yeah. So your PhD with Eugene <clears throat> Kennedy in biochemistry was right. on the assembly of lipid bilayers, That's right. correct? Yeah. So then how did you transition to the Harvey Lodish lab for your postdoc and what did you learn there? Okay, so as I was finishing uh, graduate school, so I, MD PhD program, I finished my PhD uh, and actually there's an event in there that, um, that was actually much more important than any of that for me as a sort of deciding point, which was uh, I was about 25 years old and I started getting offers to become an assistant professor in various departments, including the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford. And that was a little young even for those days, probably by, I mean, things have really changed and maybe we can talk more about this later, how, how, uh, uh, how uh, science and biomedical research has changed and not necessarily in a favorable direction. You know, uh, but uh, so I, I was at a very young, a young stage, I was given a choice of either going back and completing my last year or so of medical school or accepting a job in the Stanford Biochemistry Department as an independent uh, faculty member, as an assistant professor. Uh, and uh, they were very happy to have me at that stage without taking a postdoc. Okay, um, and so that was actually kind of a hard choice to give up uh, my medical studies and give up uh, an opportunity in medicine. I did ultimately make that choice. It was probably the most difficult uh, professional decision I've ever made. And so um, at that point, I, I said, okay, well, I could go to Stanford. And I made a decision sort of similar to what I, I, uh, I made. Uh, I approached that decision in a similar to way I, to which I approached going to medical school versus uh, going immediately into biomedical research, which was I felt if I didn't do some sort of a postdoc, I would be relegating myself to continuing the particular type of research that I was doing. And I, I really wanted to give a crack at a related field. And, about, and what my strong feeling was that lipids were very interesting, but proteins probably were more versatile and more interesting. And I thought I'd start to work on membrane proteins. And it was just about that time uh, in 1975 that Gunter Blobel published his uh, epical paper describing the self-free reconstitution of the insertion of, of proteins and translocation across membranes and the, the discovery of signal peptides in the signal hypothesis, which was the discovery for, for which he was recognized in the 1999 uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine. And you know, I remember being in the biochemistry library, library at Harvard and opening the Journal of Cell Biology and reading these papers in PNAS. And I was just absolutely stunned because I was intuitively reaching for something like that. Uh, and then to see that it had been done, well, that took out one problem. But it made me realize that very complex things in membrane biology could be reproduced in cell extracts. Uh, and so at that, it was really at that stage that I decided I really needed to learn about membrane proteins. I really wanted to learn about how proteins are synthesized and we'll learn how to work with cell-free extracts. And so as I looked around uh, through the scientific community, I found the ideal person just across the river, 
uh, Harvey Lodish, who at the time was uh, a young, I believe, uh, just barely a full professor. I think he was 35, 36. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I was, <laughs> things were a little bit different back then. So uh, rather than sending an email or writing a formal letter, I got on the phone and I, call, I called, called him up and he said, oh, sure, come on over. So I came over the next day. I don't think he had my CV or anything. Uh, and I went looking for Professor Lodish. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And, you know, he couldn't be found. Then I, I, I saw this very young-looking guy bent over the centrifuge. I said, have you seen Professor Lodish? And then he pops up with a smile on his face and he says, I'm Harvey Lodish. And so that's how Har I, I met Harvey Lodish. It was the beginning of a great relationship. He's such a superb scientist. He was a fantastic mentor, and he still is, of course, to... Uh, to many people, and everything I'd hoped to learn, I learned. Uh, and uh, one of the things I also learned from Harvey uh, was how to run a lab. Uh, you know, uh, Harvey ran a you know a reasonably large size lab. He had a couple of research topics, and besides his scientific gifts uh, and his uh, a, a personal charisma that uh, that is attractive to students and fellows, also uh, he. Uh, uh, very well organized, and so I kind of I, I learned things in multiple dimensions. So a few years later, you yeah. did end up taking Stanford up on their offer. I did. And well, actually, I actually, which my, I, I accepted the offer. See, I had the world's best postdoc, okay, because I accepted the offer at Stanford, but I said to uh, Arthur Kornberg and Bob Lehman, "Can you uh, can you delay this for a year, or a year and a half?" And they said, "Sure." So it was perfect. So I never had to worry about getting a job. Uh, and, uh, and I had absolute freedom as a postdoc. So you were extraordinarily young by yes. today's standards. Extremely, at getting your, Extremely so, yeah. Your first position. So what advantage do you think that puts you at that we're handicapping people now by delaying and delaying things? I think it's an enormous advantage. You know, it's uh, the situation now, the average uh, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe at the NIH grants, the average uh, uh, age for the first uh, so-called R01 grant is around 44, 45, something like that in the mid-40s. It's, as any kind of a measure, that is extraordinary. I had my first NIH grant at 27, okay? I'm 63 and I'm in year 40-something of one of my grants, okay? So, no, that's not true, 38. Now 39, it just got renewed. You're this young assistant professor. Yeah. These extraordinary ideas about how to do things within cell-free extracts that everyone yeah. is advising you yeah. is never going to work, and you're never going to get funding. You're never going to get students, but yet you did. So how, what, you know, specifically, how did you gather students to come and work with you? Okay, well, let's take those one at a time. Actually, in the first thing, first, the first point you make, a lot of people were very discouraging about the, not to me personally, but mm -hmm. to the, about the approach that I wanted to take. That is absolutely true. Uh, and uh, and if, I, if I were to li have listened to the, the popes in the field, uh, it wouldn't have been very productive, okay? That's true. Uh, funding. I got plenty of funding at the time. It was never an issue, okay? Um, one of the reasons I went to Stanford, uh, frankly, apart from everything else, uh, was the fact that the senior faculty, despite the fact that it was probably illegal at the time, they pooled all their NIH funds into one pot. And it was made abundantly clear to me that if I spent more than I brought in, that would be fine. Okay? Eventually, I'd have to make it up to the department as I became more senior and I could bring in more money. That's what they did. Okay? And uh, it was a very interesting and very unusual culture, by the way, in which we all shared lab space. There were no walls between labs. I've never seen anything like it before or since anywhere. Uh, it was an extraordinary environment for that reason. And that contributed a lot. Okay? But then attracting students. Um, somehow students then were maybe a little less career oriented than they are now. I mean, the students that you, we see today, and it's completely understandable given the environment, feel like they have to tick boxes and, and they, they regard themselves as trainees and they have a career path and they're being mentored. Uh, and uh, I don't think, uh, I've probably quote mentored many students but not knowingly. Uh, I never was mentored, at least not knowingly. Uh, and uh, you know, I've been de-mentored a few times perhaps but not mentored. I mean I'm not knocking the fact that we do these things but, but the, the, the idea of science as a career therefore as a um, uh, as a uh, 
uh, as a uh, kind of a well-trodden path where you have to tick certain boxes to go on is much more a, a, a part of the world today. I had no trouble attracting students and fellows, uh, precisely because it was adventurous. Okay? Right. None. Okay? Because they had, as I did, a sense that you, do what, you try to do what's important, you take a risk, uh, and what are the consequences anyway? You might lose six months in the lab, whatever. Uh, it just people didn't think about things in such a careerist way back then. It sounds kind of almost unbelievable, uh, what, but, but it was absolutely true. When you started to have some success with these cell-free extracts, mm -hmm. the atmosphere around the laboratory must have been pretty electric. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that time and what you were going through and also mm -hmm. the atmosphere as uh, some science was coming out of the Scheller and Sudoff and Schechtman labs mm -hmm. that all sort of formed a, a better view of how vesicle right. transport was actually happening. And was that a collaborative or a competitive environment? Okay. Well, you know, it was a very exciting time. Um, we first, we are, the first success in reconstitution in an extract was around 1980. That was our first paper. And it was a very rough, crude system. Uh, by, by, the, by around 1984, uh, we uh, had made a robust version of this cell-free assay. Uh, we, in this case, means uh, Bill Balch, when he was, he's now at Scripps, uh, but at the time, obviously, was not. He was a postdoc in my lab. And uh, I'll never forget um, the, uh, the day that he came back from the electron microscope facility. You know, Bill was someone who, uh, you know, it, he, 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 it, it can be quiet, but at the same time, it gets very excited, uh, and he, uh, for days, I was saying, Bill, let's go look at this sample in the electron microscope. Maybe we'll see some vesicles, you know. And, you know, I didn't think he was doing it. And then one day he comes back, he says, with his very quiet Midwestern way, well, Jim, I have something to show you. And he pulls out these electron micrographs, and I just about fell on the floor because there were all of these beautiful vesicles budding off of Golgi, membranes that we'd isolated. They had no vesicles, and they they had returned to the morphology that George Pilate described in the living cell, but they had been resuscitated to life by a cytosolic extract and a source of energy, ATP. And at that moment, I knew that we really had something important, okay, and that it was really going to, uh, uh, I didn't know how long it would take. Uh, at some level, this is before, you know, genomes were known and before uh, uh, cloning, it was even before reverse genetics and yeast. Um, and it, I, I had a feeling it would be a long, hard slog, and I was hopeful sometime during my lifetime uh, we would understand uh, the question of uh, answers to, to, to many of the questions that we did finally solve. It, they came much more quickly than I thought. I would say by 1993, 1994, we had the principal answers in hand. So that was a mere, uh, what, uh, 85, uh, seven, eight years later? It was extraordinarily rapid. So j that period of time, uh, uh, for me uh, and for my lab uh, was uh, just an extraordinary experience. Now, in relation to what was going on in other labs, because there, actually there are several different lines of discovery in this field that came together in various mergers at various times. Now, at the time, uh, yeast genetics, uh, as we know it today, did not exist. It was known really from the Hart Lee Hartwell uh, kind of uh, 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 approach to the cell cycle. It was known that you could, it was known how to get mutations. It was not known how to organize them in computation groups. And it was known how to map them in terms of their order in the pathway. That was known. And Randy, uh, within a matter of a couple of years, succeeded in identifying initially 23 genes, but not molecularly characterizing them, having 23 strains mm -hmm. that were defective in secretion in yeast in various ways and in different ways because the mutations complemented each other. He could map them crudely. But the technology, which is called reverse genetics in yeast, had not yet been invented uh, by Fink, Botstein, and Davis. Okay, and that was a major breakthrough uh, that occurred uh, probably in the uh, middle 1980s, somewhere in there. And cloning and sequencing had really just been invented uh, a few years earlier coming out of Stanford, in fact, coming out of the department where I was a faculty member. Okay, so that was the era. So when Randy took on that problem, he actually, his biggest issue, was, okay, I got the genes, now do I, how do I get the proteins and try to make this somehow molecular? Mm -hmm. He had in front of him that it could be done, but the path wasn't clear. Likewise, by 1985, the same was true for me. 
except I had an extract with proteins that I could fractionate, and it was darn hard to purify proteins, uh, especially if there might be 10 or 20 of them required at the same time. Okay? That was the state of the field. Now, synaptosomes, the third, the third uh, line of approach, was much more narrowly configured. Randy and I, each quite independently, we, I think we collaborated a couple of times along the way, but by and large these are completely independent projects, uh, had essentially a parallel non-intersecting path until about uh, 1988, 1989, and I'll come to that in a moment, because that was the first convergence. But there was another line of discovery that was initiated by uh, Richard Scheller and by Tom Sutoff uh, independently, uh, and working actually with other, with, with other folks, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, Pietro de Camilli and Reinhard Jan, who worked closely in one or another way uh, with each other and with, uh, uh, and with uh, uh, Tom Sutoff. Okay? So we all kind of got to know each other, uh, you know, and there was a lot of communication going on, but things were quite separate. Now, the, the, the view of, uh, of Sudhoff and Scheller and others, the neuroscientists, was very narrow. They wanted to, but important, they had in mind, they wanted to solve the problem of how that synaptic vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane to release the neurotransmitter, and especially how it's controlled by calcium. Okay? So, uh, what, what the neuroscientists did, Scheller, Sudhoff, and others, was to take what we would call a proteomics approach today. So their approach was essentially structure based. Mm -hmm. Randy and my approach was function based. When you have a mutation that affects a transport step or any process, it must have eliminated a component that was functionally required, directly or indirectly. The same thing if you have a protein that's required in a cell-free extract. Um, in a proteomic approach, you isolate the organelle, the synaptic vesicle, which was really just then available for the first time, and, that, and, and Sudhoff and Scheller really recognized that, and they said, well, let's try to characterize the proteins that are in it, because they have to be important in one or another aspect of the synaptic transmission process, okay? So they identified these proteins one by one, taking them off of gels, micro-sequencing them, and it was quite a difficult thing to do in those days to, to clone individual cDNAs, but they did that. The result of which was an important, uh, let us call it, catalog of information mm -hmm. of amino acid sequences, they named the proteins, and they, they were able to anatomically localize them by cytochemical techniques or by fractionation in the vesicle, in the plasma membrane, or in the cytosol. It wasn't a complete catalog, but it was an important catalog. So now we have three lines of discovery. How did they come together? Okay. Two of which were functionally based, one of which uh, was uh, the, the synaptic vesicle was structure based, and therefore was guesswork as to which protein. You had all the proteins, but which one does what, mm -hmm. if any of them do anything in particular. Do you see what I mean? So that's where the field was. Now, um, the first protein that, um, that was identified molecularly uh, that was the, to be important in vesicle transport was a protein we discovered called NSF, anethylmalamate sensitive fusion protein, which we purified from our cell-free extracts, and I think we first purified it around 1988. We discovered it was required somehow in membrane fusion. Uh, then with Oxal Ulrich at Genentech, uh, we were able to clone it, and when, when we looked at the sequence, it was astonishing that uh, it was identical to the sequence of one, one of Randy's SEC genes called SEC18. We, the sequence had been published, but again, still nobody knew quite what the protein did at that point. It was somehow needed for transport, but it was only a couple years later that Randy could establish it was needed in fusion. But that was a very important coming together because uh, Randy and I and, all, and, and everyone realized, uh, each from their own point of view, that there must be a universal set of machinery in the secretory pathway. And in fact, Randy and I and others went on, uh, and this was our collaborative work, to find another protein that was in common between the pathways, and actually that the, that the, uh, the human gene uh, could be placed in a yeast, uh, and it would actually function as if it were a yeast gene. Okay? So we knew there was a huge commonality, mm -hmm. and so what that meant were two things. Thing number one is that the pathway is universal. That meant uh, two things. It meant first the pathway was universal, uh, and secondly, it meant that our cell-free in vitro biochemistry is not an artifact. Mm -hmm. Because haunting all of this uh, was the possibility that somehow we had some sort of a complex artifact. Uh, it wasn't really a serious doubt, at least in my mind, but every project has its critics, and we certainly attracted ours, and that was a doubt. And so much of that sort of evaporated at that one moment. So that was a huge coming together 
of, uh, of yeast and animal genetics and biochemistry. And from that point on, they never separated. Uh, there was another line of discovery, which is the cloning of these synaptic vesicle proteins. And it was starting to yield fruit because reverse genetics was coming on board. So now you could actually knock out a gene, you could uh, perturb a gene by overexpression, uh, microinject antibodies, and so on. And so more and more we began, we began to have approaches that could help uh, the neuroscientists figure out uh, uh, what their proteins might do. The first answer actually came from left field. And it was, uh, 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 came from Cesar Montecuco in Padua. And Cesar was trying to uh, solve a classic problem in neuropharmacology, how toxins like botulinum and uh, tetanus work. You know, obviously these are extraordinarily potent uh, poisons and it was known for decades that they paralyze and they cause a blockage in neurotransmission, but how? And Cesar discovered uh, in the uh, late 1980s uh, th that uh, they were, these, these are all actually proteases. They are, in fact, very specific proteases. And in 1992, December of 92, he published that one of them, in particular, uh, 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 botulinum toxin, uh, it has only one major substrate in the brain. And that substrate turns out to be none other than a protein called VAMP or synaptobrevin, which had been cloned originally uh, by Scheller and Sudhoff at about the same time. And so a few months later, when we discovered the complex that was responsible, uh, and we postulated it to be responsible for exocytosis at the synapse, as well as related complexes uh, in other, er other aspects of cell biology and physiology, when we found that very protein in, that, in the complex, that is what kind of, uh, that, that finding had a huge impact. So the main coming together, uh, frankly, of the neuroscience uh, linkage was through the result of Montecuco. And then at that point, with our paper in Nature in the spring of 93, uh, that, catalyzed an enorm I mean, that catalyzed the realization that there was another convergence that was happening. And at that point, it was, a, it, was an, it was a stampede and probably did become very competitive. But up until that point, if it was, I, I, didn't, I didn't really think it, we, we all thought of it as separate fields. This work that you and Sudoff and Sheckman were doing all around the same time, right. competitive or collaborative, was recognized last year with the Nobel Prize right. in Physiology or Medicine. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the hoopla that surrounded it? I heard you had a 50-person delegation, <laughs> that uh, one of whom has mentioned that he found you very difficult to keep up with because you were tireless and had a wonderful time. Well, I don't know if I was tireless, but uh, yeah. certainly I had a wonderful time, and I think just about everybody else who I was fortunate to have with me. Uh, you know, I, I, we, we, my wife Joy and I had a motley crew of uh, you know, family, of course, uh, friends, uh, and uh, I have a habit of collecting friends, so they go back a long ways, and so we went back actually to my college roommates, uh, and so uh, who, we get together actually every year for a kind of reunion. We had a great time, and many uh, personal friends and scientific friends. It's an extraordinary experience, and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly encapsulate it, but uh, you know, it's, uh, for Sweden, the, the closest way to, the, the best analogy for what the Nobel events are like in, in Sweden is uh, the Nobel Prize is to Swedish culture uh, what uh, the Academy Awards is to American culture. And it's a little hard to imagine, but it's a small country uh, and, uh, it, and, and royalty is involved and it's uh, quite an extraordinary thing and, uh, to, to recall. It's great. What does the next 10 years hold for you? Uh, you know, the honest answer to that, Ushma, is I don't know, uh, because I've never been able to answer that question. Uh, I can sort of tell you the directions that I'm going in. Uh, I have every intent to, uh, to remain a very active researcher and professor, uh, run, run a, you know, a lab that contributes at the, at the forefront. Um, there are two problems that I'm focused on now uh, with about equal intensity. Uh, you know, we know a lot about how vesicles fuse at some level, uh, from Tom Sudoff's work especially, uh, who, and Tom, Tom's principal contribution in the whole affair uh, uh, was, was, he's done many things, but is recognized in the Nobel Prize, was the discovery of the machinery that's specific to the synapse that, mm -hmm. that is responsible for the pinpoint precision uh, of, of, of release of neurotransmitter. Randy and I essentially worked out the general pathways, and 
including how the vesicle fuses. But most vesicles in the body uh, are auto, sort of on, they fuse all the time. But if your neurotransmitter vesicles fused all the time, we'd actually be pretty stupid. Right. Uh, because uh, everything would happen in about a millisecond and there'd be nothing left. So for the brain, it's all about waiting until the right moment when, when a circuit requires neurotransmission and then to have that occur promptly. Tom figured out the proteins and a lot about the physiology of how that happens. Okay? But we still don't understand at a biochemical or structural level how that works. And that's exactly what, what, what I'm trying to figure out right now in my lab. And the other is a long-standing problem that goes back to my earliest days uh, at Stanford, which is uh, when we reconstituted transport in a cell-free extract, we set out originally to reconstitute the transport from endoplasmic reticulum to Golgi because that process was known from George Pilati. What we found instead was we reconstituted the transport of proteins within the Golgi stack. Why? It was the strongest process. So in an extract, it was the most, uh, it had the biggest signal. We've, I found myself in the very awkward position of having reproduced a process in a cell-free extract not yet known to occur. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard enough to prove when you have a reaction in a cell-free system that it's an authentic reconstitution. Imagine how hard it is to prove that something that you've reconstituted that is not even known to occur in nature is a faithful, predi faithful predictor of what should be and will be occurring in nature. So that has occupied me for a long time. And we've, got, we've, we've established various levels of proof, but it's still not proven. And so uh, I'm now rededicating myself, uh, not from that narrow point of view, but from a broader point of view, to understanding how trafficking occurs in the Golgi stack and what the itinerary of the vesicles are going forward and backwards. And as it turns out, we do not have the technology, even today, to reveal that. That is because we cannot, we cannot observe objects the size of vesicles or ribosomes or large macromolecular structures involved in signaling processes that are so important in physiology and disease. We know they're important, but we can't watch them or monitor them in cells, and we can't monitor them with molecular specificity. There are technologies that exist today that could be improved to enable that. They're called super-resolution optical microscopy. So I am focusing at Yale and the other part of what we do and through collaborators, including other faculty collaborators, on developing the next generation of microscopes where we can do what amounts to video fluorescent electron microscopy, but with light. And that we, so what we can do that. And I don't think we're more than two or three years away from it at this point. And when we get there, will be able to solve many classic problems in cell biology and I think also in molecular medicine. I can't wait to see that. Um, Me either. <laughs> all right, just a couple of quick last questions then. Um, do you have a favorite color? No. Do you have a favorite scientific? Now, Ushma, I have to answer that question accurately. With which eye? I happen to be colorblind in my right eye and, uh, and normal uh, in, in color vision in my left eye. Fascinating. Yeah. Didn't know so I can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can now answer your question with a question, in which eye? And, uh, the, and the answer is, uh, where I can see the colors, blue. That's a serious answer. All right. Can you recall your first experiment? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Can you tell definitely. us about it? Yeah, it was a mouse named Seymour. Uh, he was my favorite pet mouse, and it was uh, my seventh or eighth grade science project. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's really a, you know, a very, a very sophomore project, but I, was, uh, I, I built a maze, and I wanted to time the animal in the maze. And I remember, it was the space age, and it was probably 1962 or three. Uh, Alan Shepard was launched in 1961. They're about, so it was just in that era, okay? So I wanted to do a space project. So I took Seymour and I built a centrifuge on top of the table. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, so what, what I would do is put him in the centrifuge for various amounts of time, uh, and then time how long, what, the effect that that would have on Seymour to get through the maze. And that was, my, that was my first experiment. That was my science project. Not surprisingly, if he was spun around longer at a high G-force, I took him up to about 7G. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a little bit compromised. Now, 
Actually, I should mention that there were some unexpected consequences in the experiment. One time, we had in our basement a billiards table. And I built the centrifuge on the billiards table. And one time, I put Seymour in this home-built, uh, you know, built it with my own hands, obviously, uh, motor-driven uh, centrifuge. And it wasn't caged or anything. It would just go round and round. So I, I and things spinning, slow it down, and look, in the, look in the compartment. Where's Seymour? Seymour couldn't be found. And, and then I look on the, one of the pockets in the billiard table, and there's Seymour coming out of it, you know, <laughs> looking like he was, and he'd been thrown out of the spinning centrifuge, and like an eight ball landed right in the pocket. So that was my first science experiment. Would you ever run for public office? <laughs> that's funny. No. <laughs> Uh, and that's, I, that's a question I've never been asked, and I won't even ask you why you asked it, but no, the answer is I could never even imagine that. I can't imagine not being a scientist. Well, it, when you were a kid, you mentioned potentially being a fireman. Well, that was sort of a bit of a joke, right? If you had to do it all over again, and you couldn't choose science or medicine, what do you think would <clears throat> have captivated you? Hmm. I can't, you know, I, I, I'm often quoted these days by people for having one thing I said once, which is don't take advice from old men, okay? <laughs> which is true, okay? I mean, I, I really believe people should form their own directions. I can't, uh, to be perfectly serious, I can't put myself back into the mold, uh, into the position of being, you know, 18 or 20 or 22 years old in the mindset, especially of someone today. I really couldn't answer that question, you know? I think I probably would have found a way to be a scientist no matter what. Uh, you know, actually, I, I, if I could turn that around in a, in a sort of a, a different way, uh, I advise a lot of students at Yale now, sometimes undergraduates. Uh, we have freshman advisees, also seniors. Uh, and, and, and as they kind of uh, uh, get close to graduation, or let's say a junior, typical question is, oh, you know, I'm thinking about maybe I should go to medical school, or. I think I might want to do biomedical research, and I'm kind of on the edge, what should I do? And what I always tell people is, ask yourself the following question. If someone told you today you could never be a scientist, okay, no matter what, what would it feel like? And if someone would say, oh, I, th I would find that kind of discouraging, and I'd say, well, you shouldn't be a scientist. But if someone, said, if someone says to me, I feel like, I would feel like someone just kicked me in the gut Okay, and my firstborn son uh, was uh, deathly ill, okay? If that's what it feels like, which is the way it would have felt to me, then I'd say, you should go into science, no matter what, because you can't do anything else, you know? And so I think the answer is, I was gonna be a scientist no matter what, right? I mean, if you're, if you're uh, a filmmaker, okay, uh, as, uh, as you have in this studio here, or you're uh, a young artist, okay, or a young novelist, you know, would, would you ever tell such a person not to do it? I think good science uh, is not so different than that. You know? So that's why in some ways I reject the question, what was the alternative? I, I don't think there is an alternative. And I think frankly for young scientists, if you feel there's an alternative, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult way forward and you shouldn't do it. Thank you so much for joining <clears throat> me today. It was a real treat hearing your views about your own science and issues beyond it. Well, thank you, Ishma. That's really terrific. And I hope the people that, uh, that uh, watch this video uh, uh, find, find the video enjoyable and uh, continue to read the Journal of Clinical Investigation, which is a journal I'm very proud to have been associated with. <laughs>